To experience what I'm going to talk about, may I ask a few volunteers to take in a deep breath. Breathe out. That nice feeling you've just had is because you've just pushed additional oxygen into your system. Working in a rural hospital on the shores of Lake Victoria in Western Kenya, we had an interesting acronym called POW. It did not mean the prisoner of war, but meant a pediatrics observation ward. But it felt more like a battlefield because this is the place where a man fought disease every day. And I often felt like a true prisoner of war every time I lost a baby to severe pneumonia. With each death, I lost a piece of my heart, and it happened so frequently. One day, in our usual routine duties, we had a baby with severe pneumonia. Together with my team, we had battled to save him. His name was Moses, nine-month-old baby, very bubbly. As Moses was beginning to feel better, another baby showed up. But remember, Moses was hooked to our only available oxygen cylinder in the unit. Because this other baby was too sick, and if we didn't give oxygen immediately, she would certainly die, we disconnected Moses to give uh, oxygen to this other baby. It was a cold season, and pneumonia cases were on the rise. Moses survived, but not without some brain damage. He lives today with blindness and a bit of hearing loss. He's one of the lucky few to survive. Over the last almost 20 years, I've observed so many children die because of lack of oxygen, an element that is so common, but we are not able to provide it where it's needed most. It's not just in Kenya. This is a common problem across the developing world. For those who follow the news, you may have read something earlier in August when uh, more than 90 children died in a hospital in India, allegedly because the vendor who supplied that hospital with oxygen had cut off supplies because of non-payment of bills. Now, oxygen is pretty abundant in the air. It's the third most common element and uh, forms 21% of our atmosphere. But when children like Moses are too sick, they are not able to get the oxygen they need from the air. They need supplemental oxygen from the cylinders and other sources. Now, currently, when you look at the world, uh, in places like uh, the United States, Oxygen is plentiful in hospitals. It's all over the walls when you walk into any hospitals. It's available in frozen tanks where it flows freely uh, to where it's needed. But this approach is too expensive for the developing countries to afford. I'll show you what you'll see in most of, uh, most of our countries. You will see something like this. Oxygen is often supplied using the cylinders and when you track one of these cylinders, currently, you'll realize that it's filled some 1,000 kilometers away and moved over time to the facilities where it's needed. So this, because of the transportation and the inefficient systems they are in, it's also fairly expensive for, for those settings. By the time it gets to the patient, it's fairly expensive. Now, one would ask, for those who know the technology and the oxygen space, why can't you use concentrators? They're used fairly often, but they need electricity. I remember a few years back, and many of you can remember, when there was a power outage in New York City. I was visiting my mom then, and there was a really hilarious story of a family that was trying to light their dinner table from the headlight of an SUV. And she was quite shocked and saying, but don't these people have candles? And I said, Mama, they have candles, but mainly for romantic dinners. They've never thought of them <laughs> <laughs> as something that you use as a backup 
source of lighting because maybe this was the first time this was happening. Now, in my hospital, during the rainy season, two things happened every day. We were sure that we would get a child with pneumonia and there would be a power outage. So if you're relying on the concentrator, then it won't work when you need it most. So there's a solution that you can use. It's something like this. It's a pressure swing adsorption technology. This technology harnesses oxygen from the air we breathe and can fill it into these cylinders that you see at 2,000 bars. Once you fill it there at 2,000 bars, you can actually direct it to patients even if there's no electricity. One would ask, this technology has been with us for from the 70s, how comes we've not been using it um, as required? It, it's fairly expensive if each hospital tries to set it up for themselves and also very difficult to maintain. So, but if you organize it in a way that a number of hospitals share it, then it becomes affordable and a very good source of oxygen in resource-limited settings. To address the problems that I've faced as a hospital administrator, I founded a company called Hewatele. It deploys this technology to produce oxygen close to where it's needed most. We produce it within the district. And we have a distribution channel that uh, goes for approximately a radius of 100 miles, and we serve approximately 100 health facilities from one plant. It's a milkman distribution model. And we find that makes it really cheap and affordable uh, for these health facilities, and we can have an interrupted supply uh, throughout the year, whether it's raining or not. Now, in 2017, uh, the World Health Organization had a major policy change that now classifies oxygen as an essential medicine for treatment of sick children. I think this is an important uh, direction because they've had a similar policy which only classified it for other uses for 30 years and so this gives us an opportunity to work with government to supply oxygen where it's needed most. My approach is to structure this in a public-private partnership model. It transfers the risk of oxygen supplies from the government and their facilities to a local operator that is competent and able to run it effectively throughout the year. There are many other players working in this space to develop solar solutions uh, for more resilient concentrators, to develop pulse oximetry, and to develop many other things around oxygen. And I think together, if all these things come together, then we will be able to avoid the deaths that we saw in India uh, earlier in the year, or the tens of thousands that go unreported each year because of lack of a simple element like oxygen. I look forward to the day when doctors will not have to choose which baby's life to save. Thank you very much. <laughs>